Welcome. It is wonderful to have you all with us. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Um, wherever you are in the world, thank you for joining us today for this webinar entitled Overlooked Injustices Faced by Persons Living with Disabilities During COVID-19 and Beyond. Um, my name is Zahira McNatt and I'm Chair of the Department of Community Health and Social Medicine here at UGHE. Um, our department was launched in 2019 and we're committed to research, teaching, advocacy, and action towards the advancements of health for populations um, who have been pushed to the margins or who are underserved by health in other sectors. So we are so delighted to be hosting today's webinar on disability and COVID-19. Some of our recent work in this area includes a new dynamic partnership with Rwanda National Union of the Deaf. Um, and we are excited to be able to continue learning and listening with all of you. Please also note that today's event is part of the Ask Professor Anya series, which includes amazing webinars like these and dynamic social media exchanges on Twitter and Instagram with UJG Zone Vice Chancellor, Professor Agnes Benaguajo. Um, in addition, today's discussion is being held in solidarity with the United Nations World Day of social justice. So thank you, thank you for joining us, for being here with us, for spending your time with us. For those who need closed captioning, please note that that is at the bottom right-hand side of your screen. And if you face any challenges, please notify our tech team through the chat. So let's get started. We are here with a distinguished panel of guests. And so let me introduce the first of our four speakers. Mr. Maxwell Gomera is currently a resident representative for UNDP Rwanda and is a resource economist with over 20 years of experience in nature conservation and agricultural development. He's worked on economic development issues, including being part of the team that developed the Global Green New Deal for reviving the global economy and boosting employment in response to the financial crisis of 2008. Max has worked extensively with governments and corporates from across the world on a range of issues, including tourism development, human rights, and wildlife management. Max is a senior fellow of Aspen New Voices, and we are delighted to have him with us today. Maxwell has also been a member of many governing boards. Please join me in welcoming Maxwell to this conversation. We're also joined by Dr. Sherry Blowett, who's an assistant professor in physical medicine and rehabilitation at Harvard Medical School and an attending physician at Brigham and Women's Hospital and Spalding Rehabilitation Hospital. She serves as chair of the Mass General Brigham COVID-19 Disability Task Force, as well as the city of Boston's Mayor's Health Equity Task Force. Dr. Blowett is also a former Paralympic athlete in the sport of wheelchair racing competing for the United States team in three Paralympic Games. In 2016, Dr. Sherry was the recipient of Harvard Medical School Harold Amos Faculty Diversity Award. Dr. Sherry, a warm welcome. Thank you so much for joining us. Our third panelist is Claudine Humure. Claudine is a partnership coordinator at the University of Global Health Equity, where she serves as the in-country host for the university's donors, partners, and guests from all over the globe. As a member of the Rwanda Society for Prosthetists and Orthodists, Ms. Humure has worked on several projects to advocate for and support amputees and the wider disability community in Rwanda. She's worked at the MIT Media Lab with the Biomechatronics Group and at Autodesk Inc. Claudine designed a 3D printable prosthetic socket for transfemoral amputees, a project that earned her the Ozzy Genius Award. Please join me in welcoming UGHE's own Claudine Humure to this dynamic conversation. And finally, but so excited to have our final guest here, Rupsha Malik is the Director of Programs and Innovation for CREA and is responsible for developing and implementing strategic initiatives and programs in India, the South Asia region, and across the globe. She provides programmatic oversight for CREA's work at the intersection of disability, gender, and sexuality. 
Rupsha has over two decades of experience in advocating for sexual and reproductive health and rights and gender equity and justice in various capacities. Previously, she's worked with the National Foundation for India, the Center for Health and Gender Equity in the US and the South Asia Regional Office of the International Planned Parenthood Federation. What a lineup. We are in for a wonderful discussion with some great panelists. Once again, I thank you all for joining us, both our panelists and those of you who have logged in today to be part of this discourse. I'm personally honored to be with you. And I'd like to now invite Professor Agnes, Vice Chancellor of UGHE, to chair the remainder of the session. Professor Agnes, the floor is yours. Thank you, Zaira, for uh, this introduction and for setting the tone uh, and also presenting our uh, speakers that are really wonderful. So I thank you all, speakers and attendees, uh, for being with us in this important conversation and for using this platform to raise awareness on the injustice faced by people with disabilities during this pandemic and beyond. Thank you to our host, Zaira, the chair of the Department of Community Health and Social Medicine. This department maintains collaboration on the core pillar of education across Department of UJG across research and advocacy and actions and is committed to equity in health for persons with disabilities and communities that has been historically disenfranchised. So the chair of the department, uh, Zaira, Dr. Zaira, uh, can be contacted uh, if you want to know more uh, through her Twitter account and also through the web of UJG. As an university, we are already incorporating holistic education and equity as a driving force. And it is now more than ever critical to bring together experts and change makers who champion disability inclusion and awareness for disability rights during these challenging times. In the wake of the pandemic, we should aim to support the most vulnerable and our work must include, protect and empower those with disabilities. We had brilliant insight during, we are going to have brilliant insight during this event. So I would like to extend my warm thanks to all the attendees for your strong engagement throughout the whole session. Uh, I hope that it will be so. I also want to give a special thank and um, to all the, to all of you for being here. So we have very experienced knowledgeable panelists for joining us today. Our webinar today will feature different global expertise as Zaira have told you uh, for today webinar and for all the other webinar for the series, Ask Professor Agnes, we have implemented a, a, a new technology, assistive technology for us, uh, so that it will allow people deaf or have hard to hear uh, to follow exactly the discussion and what the expert will say, what the question will be and the answer. Our, our speakers have also been prompt to be more descriptive of any image of all slides so that we will accommodate also people with visual impairment. In the month of February, the United Nations have marked the World Day of Social Justice to tackle issues such as human rights, social protection, exclusion, and other forms of injustice. The COVID-19 pandemic has exacerbated pre-existing social injustice. They didn't create more. But the, the people living in disadvantaged situation have seen their life being more difficult. They have been left out of the conversation. And this is the case of people living with disabilities because of lack of inclusive mechanism to help people living with disabilities, 
to better response or cope with the pandemic. However, the social justice the social injustice faced by persons living with disabilities are not new. Globally, it is estimated that 1 billion people, accounting for 15% of the population, experience some form of disabilities due to several reasons, such as genetic, such as diseases, injuries, or trauma. The impact of disability takes many forms ranging from physical pain, limited limitation in mobility, as well as emotional and physical challenge. In many cultures, disability is associated with a form of punishment or curse, and persons with disabilities are excluded from their community, with some families deciding to hide them indoor to avoid social judgment. This form of discrimination coupled with the day-to-day -day stereotyping leads persons with disabilities to also face mental health conditions such as higher rate of depression compared to the general population. During this pandemic, barriers faced by people with disabilities with visible and invisible disabilities including simple limited access to go alone to uh, seek health care, like people with hear impairment or vision impairment have faced far more problems than all of us. And measure to stop the spread of COVID-19, such as social distancing guidelines, often do not include what it takes for those who rely on person, personal assistance and working form to be taken in account and to have their life facilitated. For example, a research in Paraguay estimated that 40% of people with disabilities became unemployed after the start of the quarantine, which significantly impact household income. Even though trillions of dollars are being provided globally, very few has been dedicated to the people living with disabilities and also taking in account that disabilities have intersectionalities, such as being a woman, being a girl, uh, being part of a marginalized group, being in rural area, being socioeconomically disadvantaged. As nature roll out the COVID-19 vaccination plan, people with disabilities must be included as a priority group and the context of the, the disadvantage they live on a day-to-day basis have to be waived purposely. However, simply listen to them in the vaccine rollout plan. It's not enough. Countries need to ensure that vaccine distribution infrastructure are disability inclusive. Understanding the need of people living with disability from different lens, such as gender, and different backgrounds and responding with intervention and policy accordingly is necessary to achieve the SDGs. This is beyond COVID-19. We need to assure we leave no one behind. For example, women with disability face exclusion on the basis of gender and disability. Furthermore, women and girls with disabilities are particularly vulnerable to all forms of abuse, such as gender-based violence and sexual abuse. We know that. Unfortunately, the challenge women and girls with a disability face remain poorly understood and largely dismissed. Another vulnerable group is children living with disability. According to UNESCO, 90% of children with disabilities in developing countries do not go to school or in, during ordinary time. What happened with COVID? Additionally, World Bank estimates that mortality rate of children with disability is higher as 80%, even in countries where under five mortality as a whole has decreased. Despite effort 
efforts made by, to include people with disabilities in the 2020 agenda on, of sustainable development, there is a need to invest more in disaggregated disability data to ensure that implementation of intervention for people living with disabilities are evidence-based. Disaggregated data collection and dissemination of those data is important to bring awareness and effectively address the social determinant of health, such as poverty, lack of education, economic development, and access to care. In this webinar, we are going to learn from our panelists about injustice that people living with disability around the world face in order to raise awareness on these pressing issues. And from the global to local perspective, the discussion will explore how together we can work to advocate for eliminating this injustice during this pandemic and beyond. Before driving into the discussion, let me begin by asking each of our panelists to give a short introductory remark. Join me first to welcome Maxwell Gomera. He will be sharing with us today the situation of people living with disabilities globally and the UN recommendation on legal and policy framework that provide protection to people with disabilities during COVID-19. Dear Maxwell, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Agnes. And thank you, uh, Dr. Zahir, for that uh, kind and very generous introduction. I feel very honored to join such a distinguished panel uh, on an issue that is so critical and so central to who we are as a human family. Raising a child with mental or physical differences often comes with challenges, especially if the community that you live in does not accept the child. I've seen this firsthand through a couple named Farai and Abigail in Zimbabwe. I think the couple is actually on this webinar here and they were very kind to allow me to tell their story. Farai and Abigail have raised their child with autism spectrum disorder for the past 27 years. Because learning disability and mental health issues are so misunderstood, some of their relatives called their child deranged. They accused Abigail of having played with Juju to cause this condition and suggested they visit a traditional doctor to cleanse their child. At the age of two, Farai and Abigail noticed that something had dramatically changed with their son, Lennon. He could no longer speak. And a doctor said Lennon might have recently suffered brain damage, but couldn't explain the source. 20 years later, they received a correct diagnosis. Lennon had autism spectrum disorder, or a broad range of conditions characterized by challenges with social skills, repetitive behaviors, speech, and nonverbal communication. In the meantime, Lennon's condition tore the family apart and changed the lives of Farai and Abigail. For instance, an aunt who had bought Lennon many gifts at his birth was later accused by relatives of lacing the gifts with Juju. They never saw her again for 20 years, over 20 years. Abigail left her job to look after Lennon. Various people in the community also accused her of casting a spell on her child. As Lennon grew, the only schools they could afford refused him enrollment. The only option was homeschooling. But both parents have no teaching skills nor experience with autism. Over time, both parents developed their own language and ways of communicating with Lennon. By his teenage years, the only persons who could communicate somewhat effectively with Lennon became his two siblings. Just going for a walk could be challenging. One day during a walk, 
Lennon went after a piece of glass along the side of the road, and soon a tussle broke between father and son. Passers-by looked on, equally bemused by the drama. He has smoked weed, one passerby remarked, referring to Lennon. Farai and Abigail were to learn that some in the community thought Lennon's condition was a result of drug abuse. Farai managed to overcome Lennon and they turned back towards home. Within an hour of arriving home, Lennon went missing and no one could find him. Later that night, police knocked on the door. They had a bruised and bleeding Lennon. He had been beaten up by some people, police said, ostensibly because he had snatched some food from them. Lennon was so happy to see his mom. As he and his mom hugged, he put his hand in his pocket and took out the same piece of glass that his father had stopped him from picking up. A smile brightened on his face. He had walked back to find it. And during that walk, had become a target for bullies. Now, Lennon's story of persecution, of being misunderstood, of not being provided with the resources needed to thrive is not unique. Persons with disabilities are usually among the poorest members of society and lack access to opportunities, to resources and services to achieve their potential and to cater for their needs, including enjoyment of positive health and independence. As Professor Agnes said, about 15% of the world's population live with disability of one form or the other. 80% of these are in developing countries. Here in Rwanda alone, over 87,900 children between the ages of five and 18 live with disabilities. And overall, persons with disabilities represent about 5% of the population. They face challenges in accessing services, opportunities, and resources. However, since the ratification by Rwanda of the United Nations Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities and its optional protocol in 2008, good progress has been achieved in protecting the rights of persons with disabilities, including through legislative reform and the design of supportive programs. That same year, globally, the rights of persons with disabilities became enshrined and protected by the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, which entered into force on 3 May 2008. The United Nations and its partners here in Rwanda, partners such as the European Union and partners such as HVP Gatagara, we support persons with disabilities. Our aim is to make sure that the world is a more dignified space for people like Lennon. Our work focuses on conscientization of medical professionals to use other treatment options, such as speech, speech therapy, as well as provision of appropriate medical insurance, accessible and specialized medical services. We also work on specialized teacher training programs to improve capacity to support each person according to need. We are fostering change in people's perception so that people with disabilities are supported rather than castigated out of society. We are creating opportunities for employment and matching skills with ability. We are engaging with community gatekeepers to eliminate stigma. There is potential for change and you too, to everybody who's listening, but also especially to the students and faculty at your university, Professor Agnes, you too can help people like Lennon and Lennon himself. You can use your social media presence to spread messages on how to support persons with disabilities. You can volunteer or donate to places and families who are taking care of people with disabilities including those with learning difficulties. If we shift our focus from the disability to the unique abilities, we will be able to create a more dignified world for people like Lennon. People with autism spectrum disorder can live a full 
and productive life if support and solution are merged to the spectrum of each person. The singer Susan Boyle, the film director Tim Burton, and Bill Gates, the former CEO of Microsoft, are among those who have shown that it is possible. Farai and Abigail's experience have been painful, often enlightening, but never one that they would wish on anyone. Lennon is now 27. For him, life is generally and increasingly difficult as he struggles with forced confinement and a frustration that no one really understands him. I believe in the power of prayer. I believe in modern medicine. And I believe in our society's ability for compassion. I have no doubt that one day society will understand autism spectrum disorder for what it is and provide the right resources, the right support, and the right understanding to those with it. I just hope that it will not be too late for Lennon by the time they do. Thank you, Professor, and back to you. Thank you, Maxwell, for this insightful presentation. Very personal, very straight to the point, setting the stage of the discussion. And you are right. There are huge potential for improvement of the life of those who, like Lennon, his family, faced on a day-to-day basis structural societal uh, violence uh, because not understood and not included in their community in the right way. Thank you. Our second panelist is Dr. Sherry. Dr. Sherry will be sharing with us a experience from the USA. She will discuss the data on the situation of disability in the US and the consequences of COVID and explore the professional inclusion of people with disabilities in the US. Dear Dr. Sherry, the floor is yours. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Professor Agnes, um, and also um, Dr. McNatt for the very kind introduction to the session, and Maxwell for your profound comments and personal story regarding the context of disability um, in Rwanda, and um, the personal story of Lennon, which I think helps to set the stage for today's discussion. Um, if the slides could be shared, please. Wonderful, wonderful. So for today, for my brief comments, I wanted to touch upon um, several key priorities as we've seen them emerge for disability and health equity throughout COVID-19 and how that sets the stage for future work moving forward. Next slide, please. Now, because these comments are brief, I wanted to start with really bringing it home to what I think are the top three challenges that we've seen here in the US throughout COVID-19 as it relates to disability and health equity, but also again, how that provides lessons um, and sets the stage for future work moving forward, even in a post pandemic time. The first that we've seen is the significant personal vulnerabilities of people with disabilities, even in a developed country like the US. And to me, I feel that this has been the perfect confluence or really the perfect storm of underlying health conditions, creating personal health vulnerability for the individual, but also the impact of systemic and institutional ableism, as we call it within the disability community. And many factors related to things like the social determinants of health that have deeply impacted the health of people with disabilities across our country and indeed across the world. The second challenge that I wanted to point out is persistent bias that impacts treatment decisions, but also broadly quality of life for people with disabilities. Through COVID, we've seen this play out with regard to crisis standards of care. That is the concept of who gets what treatment at what time for those who are critically ill uh, in the time of COVID. 
And we've also seen this play out with our vaccine distribution. Um, I know, of course, that vaccine distribution is at a different place in many different countries globally. But unfortunately, in, in our context, even where vaccine is available, we've seen some disparities and the role of bias in this rollout that has been quite troubling. And again, brings us back to the importance of emphasizing health equity as it relates to disability. The third is the lack of data demonstrating what impact there has been on people with disabilities uh, both in the US but also internationally. Without this data, it's very difficult for us to tell the story and really understand the impact of the disease as well as how to think about planning for future pandemics. Next slide. As it relates to personal health vulnerabilities, from an evidence-based standpoint, the US CDC or the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention has created this list of 12 conditions where research has shown that the risk of either acquiring COVID or experiencing a detrimental health impact from COVID is higher. The concern from many in the disability community is that although this is a fairly comprehensive list, there are still many things missing and many people with disabilities are indeed quite vulnerable, uh, even if the research has not really borne this out as of yet because COVID is such a new condition. Additionally, I think it's very easy to see that amongst these 12 conditions, of course, the prevalence of disability is going to be quite high. Uh, the Americans with Disabilities Act, which was passed in 1990 and amended um, and, and um, uh, updated in 2008, does include chronic health conditions um, under protection of the law um, and as part of the disability community. Therefore, it's easy to see that many people with these 12 conditions are likely to experience disability and this helps to sort of set the stage for understanding the impact on the disability community. Additionally, here in the US, <clears throat> because of the impact of policy and legislation for many decades, the likelihood of people with disabilities living in congregate settings is higher. We do know from the evidence that COVID has had a very disproportionate impact on areas like skilled nursing facilities and assisted living facilities. And it's easy to say from the data that of course, the broad proportion of these individuals are people with disabilities. Next slide. The impact of systemic ableism um, and the impact of the social determinants of health can't be underemphasized in this discussion. Um, personal medical vulnerabilities are of course, one part of the consideration, but even in a place with a high degree of health care, uh, we know that people with disabilities still disproportionately impact, are disproportionately impacted, and much of that is because of these social determinants as are noted here. Um, this is a diagram noting that social structure challenges impact the health of people with disabilities, things like fear, stigma, inaccessible facilities, inaccessible transport, over-medicalization of the condition, uh, lack of a social network, etc. Here in the US, although we are fairly advanced as it relates to disability rights, we still have a lot of challenges. And unfortunately, many federal policies that really exacerbate this link between poverty and disability. And until we really get to the root cause of some of these challenges, it'll be very difficult to provide the high quality of care that um, people with disabilities deserve and also to really mitigate the impact of many of these social determinants. Next slide. Bias is a major concern. I wanted to share with you this study that was recently published and only over the last couple of weeks by a colleague of mine here in Boston. Her name is Dr. Lisa Iazoni, and she did a survey of several hundred physicians from across the country asking of them about their impression of disability and found some fairly disturbing things. Uh, for example, a total of 82% reported that they perceive that individuals with disabilities have a worse quality of life. Only 41% were very confident about their ability to provide care, and only 57% strongly agreed that they would welcome patients with significant disability into their practice. When we think about the future of the profession and how to mitigate some of this bias, I truly feel that the inclusion of people with disabilities in the healthcare professions is one of the quickest ways that we can get at this and make a significant difference. Um, I myself am a person with a spinal cord injury and a wheelchair user and a practicing physician. And just by being in the environment and creating relationships and people understanding that, ah, it is possible for individuals with disabilities to have careers in healthcare and medicine, this has helped to reduce bias tremendously. But we have a lot more work to do 
um, towards this inclusion and to really shift the mindset of health professionals towards people with disabilities as being whole people who are worthy of the same quality of care as anyone else in society. Next slide. And finally, just wanted to end hitting home this, this difficulty with the lack of data. So unfortunately, as we've seen the response to COVID, but also other um, global health challenges, disability information is rarely collected alongside data related to race, ethnicity, language, gender, age, et cetera. And because of that, the impact of some of these conditions on the disability community remains largely invisible. Without the data, it's very difficult for us to argue at the systems level and the policy level for the importance of these programs. Um, this in and of itself would be a major shift working with different agencies, working with federal governments in order to change the context of what we're collecting regarding disability data would make a tremendous difference in the impact that we'll be able to make and educating where we need to look for policy change in order to improve for the future. Next slide. So thank you very much. I very much look forward to the discussion later and uh, back to you, Professor Agnes. Thank you, Sherry, for thank you, Sherry, for sharing with us your perspective on person with disabilities in the US. You have demonstrated clearly how people living with disabilities are not included in data. And because of that, are not included in guideline, protocol, and opportunities that are organized to facilitate them to overcome their disabilities. You also share the critical bias faced clinically by people living with disabilities. And you are right. I had a dear friend who used to tell me, if we don't count you, you don't count. And it's exactly what you share with us. Allow me to welcome now our next panelist. Claudine. Claudine is going to discuss the data and the situation of disability in Rwanda, the national legal and institution protection. People live, live, living with disabilities are benefiting. What is missing? And what was done in Rwanda to mitigate disadvantage of people living with disabilities during this critical period? of the pandemic. Claudine, the floor is yours. Um, thank you, Professor Agnes, for the opportunity to speak. And um, thank you also to Dr. McNutt for such kind introduction. Um, I also want to thank our previous speakers for their great insights. Um, I'm really, as a person, a woman who is living with a disability, it's such a great honor to be included in this conversation. So if we could go to the next slide, please. So currently uh, we don't have an updated number of persons living with disabilities in Rwanda, but we can get an idea of what the number might be by considering this percentage estimate from the World Health Organization, which states that 80% of the people living with disabilities are in developing countries. The most recent number we have is from the 2012 National Census which found that there were a little more than 400,000 persons with disabilities in Rwanda. Keep in mind that um, this number is from nine years ago when Rwanda's population size was 10.5 million. Now we have a population size of about 12.6 million. Uh, in 2016, the National Council for Persons with Disability conducted a survey where they placed over 100,000 persons with disabilities into percentage categories. Uh, this was done in an effort to help people with disabilities fully integrate into society. While this is a, a wonderful step forward, the project did not cover all persons with disabilities. Next slide, please. 
Rwanda is doing uh, many things to support the disability community across the country during COVID-19. I will just mention a few examples. Um, so the, one of the things that they're doing is uh, being done through Vision Omurenge program. Uh, the Vision Omurenge program was established by the government of Rwanda to help the extreme poor move up the ladder. Um, this group is often comprised of people living with disabilities. They get support uh, by receiving monthly stipend, uh, nutritional food, and in many different ways, like receiving vocational training and stuff like that. And this program is, is still very active during the pandemic. Uh, we also have organizations like NUDA that provide services to persons with disabilities, and these organizations are considered to have essential workers, which means that they can go to work every day, even during lockdown. Two examples of some of the work NUDA has done during the pandemic can be seen through the cases of Jeanne and Sheja. During this month of February, Nuda discovered that Jeanne, who is a woman that is living with lower limb disability and is living with her four children, they were living in a house that was falling apart. For this reason, they are working with the local, Nuda is working with the local leaders to build a new home for Jeanne. Jeanne and her four children have been surviving through a monthly income they receive from Vision Omorenge program. Unfortunately, the income is not enough to build Jeanne and her children a new home. Thanks to Nida and the local district leaders, this family will have a safe home soon. Sheja is a paraplegic girl from Kigali, whom Nuda was able to provide with a new wheelchair. You can see the wheelchair being assembled by one of Nuda's um, uh, employees in this picture. So Sheja was having severe back pains and other difficulties with her paralyzed legs. And during this pandemic, Nuda was able to, trans to transport her to and from the hospital to make sure she got the physical therapy care and other um, care that she needed. Uh, we also have like organizations like UNICEF that have been working hand in hand with the Rwandan government to support children with disabilities at their homes and help them get accommodated in learning from home. Next slide, please. I think we can all agree that COVID-19 has affected everyone in the world. Uh, for persons with disabilities, uh, there's no exception. Um, persons with disabilities, especially those with hearing loss or those with visual impairment have a hard time getting real-time information as this was mentioned by previous speakers. Um, they have a hard time getting information about what's happening with the pandemic or how the economy is doing in general. This is usually due to lack of accommodating communication means. Um, I've seen many television programs in Rwanda that include sign languages in, the, in their broadcasts. This is really great, it's wonderful. However, as I mentioned before, um, many people with disabilities do not have TVs at their homes because they are usually among the uh, most um, poor people in the country. Um, so they usually depend on the society moving. Uh, and COVID has like really halted the movements. And also accessing healthcare has become very difficult and slow because COVID-19 has placed restrictions on public transportation. Um, also prior to COVID-19, many persons with disabilities supported themselves with vocational jobs, which they are not able to do in these times. Next slide, please. Uh, there are a few things I would propose as solutions to the current injustices faced by persons with disabilities in Rwanda. I think established organizations 
should get more support in terms of funding and empowerment programs for their staff members. Since these staff members are usually the people who get to interact with persons with disabilities on a daily basis, they need to know that their work is important and it matters. As you, as you saw in my first slide, and as it was mentioned by Dr. Sherry, we need updated data. With more funding comes more opportunities for research and a chance for the disabled people to be counted. So as Professor Agnes mentioned, if, if you are counted, you matter. And if you're not counting people with disabilities, there's, it's really hard to show, that, to show them that they matter, that we matter. Also, legal laws should have reinforcement measures. For example, there is a law in Rwanda that requires all public buildings to be handicap accessible. And yet many of the public buildings in the country are still inaccessible. So we should really have uh, measures that hold people accountable. One other thing we need to change for a more inclusive Rwanda is the attitudinal and the other basic barriers. When I say attitudinal barriers, I mean things like discrimination, stereotypes, and stigma. These are views that are prevalent in our society, which really hinder a disabled person's progress. I believe this can change by creating more awareness, and awareness can be created by making space for the previous solutions that I mentioned. Uh, we also need public transportation means that are accommodating, as well as the use of right terminology in our communication styles. Having the right terminology is important to the empowerment of the disabled person and of society in general. Um, I want to leave you all with a statement I had from another webinar I attended a few weeks ago. Uh, it goes, when you do not intentionally and deliberately include, you unintentionally exclude. So let's make it our mission to intentionally include everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Claudine. This was very informat a very informative presentation showing that community actions are key and that community inclusion have to lead them. And this should be encouraged and facilitated by stakeholders and data matters. So you join Maxwell and Sherry in the community views, what we have to do, and also in the data collection that allow proper follow-up. Thank you. Our last but not least panelist is Rupsa Malik. Rupsa is joining us from India. So Rupsa will share with us the situation of people living with disability in South Asia and what are the role of NGOs to leverage resources and solutions for people living with disabilities, especially during this pandemic. Rupsa, the floor is yours. Thank you, Professor Agnes. Thank you very much for inviting Kriya and me to participate in this discussion. Thank you to all my co-panelists for your excellent insights. Uh, I think uh, starting from what you said, uh, Professor Agnes, where you laid out some of the gendered impact. Uh, Sherry, you talked about systemic and institutional ableism. Uh, all the panelists uh, did a wonderful job of demonstrating also that disability is not a homogeneous category, that we really need to think about the particularities uh, that, uh, that, uh, that impact uh, the way people uh, you know, experience their disability. I think there's been some very, very important points made around the need for evidence and data. And last but not the least, uh, Claudine, you spoke about intentional inclusion. And I want to start with that last point that you made, Claudine, about intentional uh, inclusion. Uh, Kriya is a feminist human rights organization. We are based in the global south. And uh, for the 20 years that we've existed, 
I think an important part of our practice has been about intentional inclusion. Uh, we have for the 20 years as a feminist organization, always allied with other movements, including the disability rights movement, with a particular focus on working at the intersection of disability, gender and sexuality. So my presentation is really going to be from that axis. Next slide. Uh, where I'll focus a little bit on the status of uh, women and girls with disabilities, with a particular focus on the key challenges and a gendered analysis on the access of sexual and reproductive health and rights and sexual and gender-based violence. And then I will take uh, a few minutes to talk about some of the trends and opportunities. Next slide. As has already been highlighted, I think, by most of my co-panelists, uh, women and girls with disabilities in particular have always faced disproportionate uh, discrimination, stigma, and, uh, and, and uh, COVID-19, I think, has only served to exacerbate the situation. So often when we hear people talking about the new normal, I think that new normal has been the reality and lived experience for women and girls with disabilities for a long time. Uh, data has already been shared about the large population of uh, people uh, with disabilities. So it is no surprise that in Asia and uh, the Pacific, we have over 350 million women and girls with disability. While a large proportion of women and girls are born with a disability, it's also important to note that there is a very gendered context in which women and girls acquire disabilities, uh, which are linked to lack of resources, lack of access to sexual and reproductive health services and gender-based violence. Um, I think uh, it is incredibly important as Professor Agnes highlighted in her opening comments that we really look at the issue of disability for gendered lens. Um, it is very, very important to look at that intersection and therefore also address the sort of the unique forms of discrimination that women and girls with disabilities face. And like I said, COVID has only served to exacerbate what has already been a very widely prevalent situation for that population. Next slide. I think one of the very important things that we really need to discuss, and, and, and I'm glad that this is something that I'm bringing sort of, you know, not been touched upon by the early other panelists, so I'm getting an opportunity to kind of highlight that, is really sort of the severe obstacles that women and girls with disabilities face in accessing sexual and reproductive health services. And while there is the issue of uh, institutional bias, uh, ableism, as uh, Sherry rightly highlighted, I think, you know, it is led by sort of a widely prevalent view that women and girls with disabilities are asexual and or hypersexual. And, there's, and that bias or that lack of understanding of the needs of sexual and reproductive health services really mediates the way uh, services are being provided. Um, uh, I think uh, often the, the issue of uh, the challenges that I think uh, women and girls with disabilities face is not necessarily, I think, only due to the fact of them being disabled, but it's really about the inaccessibility of the services. And that is led by the denial of individual autonomy. Uh, so in other words, you know, while we do look at health services and, and, and the attitude of health services providers, I think it needs to be placed within that broader realm of social determinants and barriers that Sherry highlighted through a wonderful visual. Uh, and, and these uh, are multiple. They're physical, attitudinal, informational, legal, and economic. And lastly, I do want to highlight that even as we discuss some of the issues related to access to services, et cetera, it is very, very important for all of us to also remember that within uh, national level laws, uh, people with disabilities have for a long time been denied legal capacity to make decisions for themselves. And while we have the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities really put forth a rights-based progressive framework often we don't see this translate into changes at national level laws until such time that I think uh, people with disabilities and in particular women and girls with disability are denied the legal capacity to make choices. 
for themselves have the right to make autonomous decisions, a lot of the issues that I have flagged here will continue to persist. Next slide. And the situation is equally bleak, I think, uh, you know, on the issue of sexual and gender-based violence. There's already data that demonstrates that women and girls with disabilities are twice as likely to face violence uh, compared to pe people without disabilities. Um, and, uh, and, and, and while some of that data is available, again, I do not think national level laws that address issues of violence, uh, including domestic violence necessarily address some of these specific issues. And it is also important to note that often the violence that women and girls with disabilities face are from their own family members, partners and caregivers, which is again, I think, a perspective that uh, that is often not taken into consideration when we are thinking about laws to prevent sexual and gender-based violence. Um, next slide. COVID-19, as has been rightly pointed out by most of my co-panelists, have, uh, have uh, created a huge exacerbation of, of, of many of the issues that I lay, have laid out. Um, and some of these have already been touched upon. Uh, and uh, so I will not repeat, uh, but I, I do think it is important as we continue in this pandemic era to really consider what, what, what really shows up as essential service when the governments are issuing guidance, are issuing what, you know, what they merit to be essential services, that we ensure that through our advocacy, we're really able to highlight that some of these issues that are considered non-essential uh, whether it's about uh, designating, let's say, caregivers as essential service personnel and therefore being able to travel and be with, uh, provide the support to people with disabilities uh, and things such as that are considered. I think uh, COVID-19 really, uh, you know, highlighted, particularly in South Asia, the mismal situation with our public health system. And I think it's true across the world. And even as the public health system has increasingly been decimated through privatization and other such uh, um, measures taken by the government, on top of that, during COVID, the remaining public health services were all kind of uh, prioritized as COVID-19 treatment facilities. And as a result, I think access to SRHR services almost completely shut down in many of the country contexts in South Asia. And within that context where we know already women and girls with disabilities faced a hostile, inaccessible public health system, uh, their access to services was completely cut out. Um, and I think finally, even as we think about sexual and reproductive health services and prevention of sexual and gender-based violence in the context of disability, we must look at those two sort of areas of service provision, legal support within that broader context of dis disability related services. We cannot look, that, look at those services in isolation uh, because then we will continually be not taking adequate measures to address the specific needs of women and girls with disabilities. Last, next slide. And finally, I would like to touch upon some positive trends and what I see as opportunities. I do think that the disability rights movement is extremely strong, robust, and strongly self-led in all of South Asia, and for that matter, globally. Uh, it, is a it's a it is a movement building story that I think many other movements have much to learn from. So expectedly, this powerful movement did a lot of advocacy during this time and was successful in South and for that matter in Southeast Asia as well to be able to advocate adequately and forcefully to ensure that their national governments classified disability support services as essential services. I do think donors in civil society in general stepped up and, and ensured the provision of emergency assistance, but I think much, much more needs to be done. Uh, even as we dwell on some of the issues that we've dwelt on during this conversation, I think it is so important to note the devastation, the economic devastation that most uh, people with uh, disabilities faced and particularly women and girls with disabilities. Uh, and therefore, I think the role of emergency assistance is vital. 
in, in, in addressing some of these issues. Most of my co-panelists have touched on the need for data. I did see some positive trends, particularly in India, there's been concerted advocacy in the last year to, to kind of, uh, you know, advocate with the national government to collect disaggregated data. I think it stemmed from sort of a global outrage and, and, and it was mirrored in, in many countries, the sort of huge exacerbation of sexual and gender-based violence that we saw during this COVID uh, pandemic. It was a shadow pandemic that played out parallelly with the COVID-19 pandemic. And I think that has really kind of visibilized this issue and the gendered context within which this pandemic has played out and has therefore resulted in some meaningful advocacy. And finally, an important point, again, I thought Sherry touched upon it when she talked about how a lot of, uh, we saw a lot of disproportionate impact of COVID-19 in institutions, in care settings. And I think it has served to visibilize, you know, sort of some of the profound issues around institutionalization of persons with disabilities and particularly women and girls with disabilities. So I hope that some of those issues that service during COVID-19 do not disappear for in the post pandemic uh, period and that we are really able to uh, meaningfully uh, as uh, allied movements and it should not be, I want to end by saying the many of these issues should not be seen only as the agenda or the priorities of the disability rights movement. It is extremely important that all of us from allied movements and organizations stand in solidarity with the disability rights movement and highlight some of these profound issues that have been issues that have been debated and advocated for by the disability rights movement for many decades. And I hope that the COVID-19 pandemic, you know, in the way that it has surfaced some of these issues, that we will continue to advocate on those issues and those opportunities that have emerged uh, out of the pandemic. And I think that's my last slide, Professor Agnes. Is there Thank anything? you. I think that's it. Thank you very much. And I hope I didn't exceed time. No, no. Thank you, Rupsa. What you say was really uh, interesting and really put the link between awareness to, for acting better as community member, as a society vis-a-vis -vis the people living with disabilities and how it's a matter of social justice. You really make the link between the two. Thank you very much. Uh, I thank all the panelists for your insightful, very complimentary comments. We got really a, a, a comprehensive view through the lens you have offered to us. I know that in our audience, uh, there are questions, but before diving into the Q&A session, I want to, remain, uh, to remind everyone that this webinar hosted by the Department of Community Health and Social Medicine is part of the Ask Prof. Agnes series, and that you can send your question directly to the box of this um, uh, webinar or through Zoom, uh, Twitter, Instagram, or Facebook. But please, if you don't use the box here, link to the webinar, use the hashtag Ask Professor Agnes, and then all the questions will be answered by the people you address the question to. Um, but don't forget the hashtag. I, let's see the question. Uh, let me direct the first question to you, Maxwell. And the question is this one. As we are organizing this webinar in commemoration of the UN Day for Social Justice, what are the measures you would propose in tackling the injustice faced by people living with disabilities? Flow is uh, yours, Maxwell. Okay. Thank you, Professor Agnes. Uh, that's such an important question. Um, what are the measures uh, we, I would propose or we would propose in tackling injustices faced by persons with disabilities? I would say we need to think about it at three levels. At an in, the first one is an, at an individual level. And I think at an individual level, we have an incredible opportunity to change the outcomes for people living with disabilities. 
But to do so, we must engage community gatekeepers, if you like, uh, including churches, or in particular churches, to change the perceptions about disability. There's enough space for awareness and spirituality uh, without compromising the objectives of other groups in society. And we can succeed too, if we do it that way. If children can learn about coronavirus and apply their learning, how much more difficult is it to teach them that a person with learning difficulties needs more time to conceptualize things and may need to be taught in a different way and may need it repeated and reminded more times than others. The second level is at an institutional level. And there I would say, let's build more dignified spaces for people with disabilities and opportunities for them to train and apply themselves because they too would like to apply themselves like any one of us. We need to remove the barriers that are stopping people with disabilities to access education, health, employment, finances. Lastly, let's look at it at a societal level. Let's address the discrimination and violence against pe people with disabilities by raising awareness about the different forms of stigma, discrimination, and violence against people with disabilities. A society-wide conversation about discrimination is long overdue, Professor Agnes. But beyond talking, we need to listen. We need to ensure that we listen to those who have not been at the table. We no longer just need constructive dialogue. We must have it. Thank you, Maxwell. So using the leaders we have, like spiritual leaders, but for them to involve the community where each and every one live. And uh, there is no excuse. You are right. It can be doable. We just need to want it. The next question go, goes to you, Sherry. And uh, this is the question. How can increased representation of people with disabilities in the healthcare workforce help to reduce bias? This is um, a call for the clinical bias you have so well um, express in your presentation. The floor is yours, Sherry. Thank you, Professor Agnes. Um, you know, uh, I think it's incredibly important for people with disabilities to be at the table and to have an active role in healthcare, the health professions, community health. Um, I think so much bias exists because we are still globally emerging out of the medical model of disability, where we see people with disabilities, as many have pointed out during this webinar, um, as people who are inherently sick or flawed. And the reality is that, yes, in some cases, people with disabilities may have a background health or medical condition, but they are part of a group that has been minoritized across society and has been denied their basic rights, right? So it's far more, we're emerging out of this medical model and really emerging into globally more of a human rights model around disability. And that of course was reinforced by the uh, UN Convention on the Rights of People with Disabilities. Um, but until people are at the table and present for conversations, it, you know, the progress moves much more slowly. Uh, one of the mantras of the disability rights movement is nothing about us without us and people with disabilities need to be at the table when decisions are made that impact their health um, and their livelihood. Um, providing opportunities for vocational training and professional training um, across all sectors, but particularly um, related to health. Um, I think could be so beneficial because, of course, it can lead to financial independence, and that's critically important. But it also shows that people with disabilities have the right to self-determination, to dream big about their futures, and to think about what they may want to contribute back to society. And seeing people with disabilities in these professional roles 
tremendously helps to reduce stigma and bias um, because once you work alongside someone, you get to know them at a completely different level and you understand their capabilities and their contributions. So um, I think for all of these reasons, because, because nothing about us without us, because increased involvement in um, healthcare, the health professions and community health can lead to increased self-determination, financial independence, et cetera. Um, and because working alongside people helps to reduce that stigma and bias, I think for all of these reasons, it's tremendously important. Um, here in the US, um, people with disabilities, as we've noted, represent about 15 to 20% of the adult population. Uh, but only in the range of three to four percent of medical students or people in medical training. And it's even lower if you think about other allied health professions like nursing or physical therapy, um, et cetera. And so we have a long way to go uh, towards um, increasing representation. Um, I think, you know, globally, that is certainly still also the case um, that there's more work to do. And we've seen progress in areas like equality around gender and race and ethnicity in the US, still a lot more work to do related to gender. We're at about, most medical school classes are now about 50-50 male, female. Um, racial, racial and ethnic representation, still a lot of work to do and disability, still a lot of work to do. Um, and I think this is a, a, a major priority moving forward. Thank you. That's, um, thank you, uh, Sherry. And it's clear that if you show the capabilities of people living with disabilities, the bias and the inclusion will be accelerated. You are right. Dear Claudine, the next question is for you. And this is the question. As you know, women are often the most marginalized group worldwide. How do you think COVID-19 has specifically affected women living with disabilities in Rwanda? Flo is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Agnes. Um, I think many of the issues that Rupska Malik mentioned in the context of Southeast Asia are similar to the difficulties women in Rwanda are going through today. Um, statistics indicate that women and girls with disabilities are three times more likely to be illiterate, three times more likely to have unmet needs, and twice as likely to be unemployed. So this is to say that women with disabilities are more likely to experience discrimination and abuse. Um, in Rwanda, COVID-19 has increased the risk of gender-based violence and the general difficulties faced by women with disabilities. And I think um, the violence is often increased because of the lack of access to sexual and reproductive health information. And also because of the stigma that already surround uh, the the surround conversations about sexual and reproductive health in our society. So also we have to remember that many women in general, not just women with disabilities, often are taking care of themselves and then also being responsible for their families. Like some of them might have children, others are pregnant. So they depend on our society being uh, open and being able to interact with other people. And COVID-19 is restricting that. So um, I don't want to like repeat myself, but many of, since many of the things uh, have been mentioned by Rupsa Malik, which is similar to uh, what most women with disabilities in the world are going through. Uh, but it's really been doubled. The, um, the difficulties have been doubled uh, due to COVID-19. And um, it's, that's the case in Rwanda as well. Thank you. Thank you, Claudine. So, we can see that the question was very pertinent. Among the marginalized, the poor woman of the group of marginalized is the most marginalized. Yeah. Um, and um, I have um, a question for our host, Zaira. 
the question is for you. People with disabilities are widely excluded or underrepresented with higher, in higher education. Uh, how important is it for professors to talk about these pressing issues to the future generation of healthcare professionals? The floor is yours, Zaira. Great, thank you so much, Professor Agnes. Um, and thank you all for such a wonderful discussion thus far and for the amazing questions that are coming in the Q&A. You know, I think here at UGHE, the Department of Community Health and Social Medicine um, has been thinking about this idea a lot. And obviously it is very important for us in the classroom space and the education space to think about, consider and talk about these issues. And I think there are two reasons. One is relatively you know, obvious. It's about raising the knowledge and the awareness of our students and our faculty and our staff on the issues that persons with disabilities face and on the actions that they can take as members of society to support their neighbors, their friends and otherwise. Um, so I think we're helping our students become better advocates and our students are in medical school and they're in you know, public health, global health education and we want them to be able to step out into, into their professions and advocate actively for um, better accommodations, for better access, for um, better equity, for the dismantling of structural violence. So I think the first thing we're doing is helping students become better advocates now and in the future. But we lost you, Zaira. Are you still there? Zaira, we will come back to you uh, later because I guess you have a portion of the answer you didn't uh, told us yet. I'm going to the next question. And uh, the question is, uh, social justice for people living with disabilities is imperative, particularly during COVID context. Can you share us the UNDP experience, so this question is for you, Maxwell. Can you share us the UNDP experience in empowering people with disability for inclusive national recovery? For inclusive national recovery, you said? Yeah. Okay. So it's about COVID, huh? social justice for people with the, uh, disabilities is an imperative um, in particularly in the COVID-19 context. Could you share with us UNDP experience in empowering people with disabilities for inclusive national recovery? Yeah, Professor Agnes, I have to say that like many agencies within the UN and our partners, our immediate priority for now has been to take care of the the medical emergency that we are facing right now to make sure that we, we have COVID uh, under control and uh, populations are not, uh, are not dying from COVID. So that has been the immediate um, um, priority. But for us in, in, uh, in UNDP, of course, our long-term goal is to develop the human capital and capabilities of people living with disabilities. So, Within the uh, period that we're talking about right now, we gave support to cooperatives of persons living with disabilities with about $4,000 per cooperative. Now that might sound like a small amount of money, but it enabled people living with disabilities in each of those cooperatives to double their income. And as a result, to be able to pay their health insurance and other livelihood needs that they might have. Recently, we extended that uh, capital injection, if you like, for the cooperatives to sustain businesses, hence allowing the members to sustain their income or even increasing, increase it. Also immediately after the break of COVID in Rwanda, we funded sign language translation for all COVID-19 communications and news on the Rwandan public broadcaster, the Rwanda Broadcasting Agency to allow members of the uh, deaf community to, to access information on COVID-19 preventive measures. 
and other public regulations with the aim of keeping them safe while allowing them to actively participate in public life during this uh, pandemic. We also funded access to community health insurance for 3,000 people to allow them to easily access health facilities for COVID-19 and other health conditions. <coughs> for a very low amount, uh, ju just to give you an example, for a very low amount of $3, $3, we can help one person with disability to access health insurance per year. Now, $3 is about the price of a beggar. If any one of us today forgoes a beggar, you can help someone for a year with their health insurance. Finally, and more recently, we worked with a, a, a local um, broadband service provider called Liquid Telecom to offer access to broadband to people living with disabilities at, an at, a, at a place called uh, HVP Gatagara. We also managed to buy smart boards to transform the teaching experience so that people living with disabilities were both able to access what is available on the internet for teaching, but also have got the smart boards that they can use to be able to, to access that education material. We were very fortunate in that the Ministry of Education offered to also put content uh, on, that, on those smart boards to enable the, to enrich the teaching experience and the learning experience for people living with disabilities. Thank you. Thank you, Maxwell. Great experience, great insight, and great concrete proposition how to help um, the, re the, the recovery uh, post-COVID with the inclusion and the contribution of people living with uh, disabilities. Rupsa, uh, there is a question for you here because it concerns civil society organization. What could be important, the, what could be important consideration for donors and allied civil society organization and movement to consider in addressing inequities faced by women and girls with disabilities? So it's a complement to what was asked uh, to, Cla uh, to Claudine. Um, please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Professor Agnes. Uh, I think one thing we must touch upon and, and, and uh, we couldn't discuss in some detail is, you know, I think it is so critical that we really take the issue of accessibility and reasonable accommodation very, very seriously. Often, I think in a lot of our online and other spaces, uh, we have not really looked at it as an issue that needs serious consideration. You know, it is left to the disability rights movement and activists to advocate for it has been such, a, you know, it has been, uh, you know, the exclusionary nature in the way we convene, let's say, or in the way we meet. Uh, so simply, you know, not being able to participate and be part of the process, I think something that Sherry touched upon as well. I think is a critical thing that we all need to think about. And again, I think COVID-19 to some extent uh, served to create visibility on exactly sort of these critical issues that have been ignored for so long. Uh, until we do that, till diverse people with disabilities are not able to be at the table to be in roles that allow them to be the decision makers. It is always going to end up being the case of others speaking on their behalf. And while I do believe, and at CRIA, we do believe that there is a role for solidarity and allyship, I do think that we need to really fundamentally address these issues of exclusion that uh, can be uh, addressed. And I was looking at some of the questions that have been posted in the Q&A box. And I note that, for example, you know, in our educational institutions, in the health facilities, so many remain so inaccessible. And sometimes people, I think, take accessibility to just mean building a ramp, but that's not enough. I mean, I yeah. think it's been highlighted the kinds of informational 
inaccessibility besides the physical inaccessibility and a host of other things that we must consider uh, and that I think is, is the way to move forward. You are right. We are reaching so soon the end, but I, I, I still have too many questions. Sherry, one for you. What are some practical ways that disability data can be better captured during COVID-19 response? Yeah, thank you, Prof. Agnes. I'll be brief. I know we're almost finished. Um, so, you know, I think the most important thing is simply for those working um, in the COVID response on behalf of federal governments, state governments, those who are really in the trenches doing the work from a public health standpoint, simply don't forget uh, to think about disability when collecting data. Um, there are many ways to get at it. Disability, as we've mentioned, is very heterogeneous. And so it's difficult to ask about hundreds of different conditions at the time of data collection. But there have been um, some good standard data sets that have been developed, um, for example, by the CDC, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Um, if people are interested, you can look up CDC six disability questions, and it shows a set of six questions that is validated that um, can be asked at the time of, you know, someone being tested for COVID or receiving a vaccine, for example, or being hospitalized. That helps us to get at the presence of disability and therefore to have some data to better understand how we're doing, you know, in what ways the disability community may, may be being disproportionately affected by things like higher rates of infection or, or higher adverse outcomes and also helping us to track our response. For example, who is getting the vaccine and is the distribution equitable? So that data is critically important. The CDC six disability questions is a good evidence-based and validated way to start. I understand that's definitely looking from a US context um, and we should think about global solutions as well and simply keep pushing on this point. Absolutely. And uh, showing that COVID is the opportunity to be better and keep those opportunities after the COVID period. Rupsa, quickly another question for you. What are some of the advocacy priorities that both the disability movement uh, as well as allied movement need to prioritize moving forward? You are on mute, my dear. Uh, sorry, I just want to reiterate, Professor Agnes, what I said during my initial uh, presentation, the need to really look at uh, issues of legal reform within national laws. I think the denial of legal capacity for uh, particularly for women and girls with disabilities around uh, decisions uh, in autonomous decisions, uh, the fact that we're still seeing a whole regime of substituted decision making that obviously we know has resulted in egregious uh, violence in violations, whether it's forced abortion, sterilization. So I think there's a whole host of issues that need to be addressed. And perhaps the pandemic and everything that it served to visibilize for us vis-a-vis -vis structurally excluded communities is the wake up call for us to continue that uh, you know, to continue to stand in support of the disability rights movements and these fundamental demands that they've had for decades, uh, not just globally, but in many country contexts. So I'll stop there because I know we are out of time. <laughs> and a uh, quick one for Claudine. Claudine, uh, you have explained uh, what is done in Rwanda, but there is another question. Could you elaborate more on other ways the government of Rwanda is making sure that the disability community doesn't stay behind during the pandemic. Yeah, I'll also be quick, but um, there's a, a number of things that uh, the government of Rwanda is doing and it's um, the government is working with established uh, organizations like HVP Gatagara to help uh, people with disabilities uh, get to hospitals. I, I mentioned in one of my slides that uh, COVID-19 has slowed down um, access to healthcare because of the restrictions on transportation. But uh, thankfully, um, many of the organizations are able to work with local district leaders to be to help them contact um, the people with disabilities from their homes and then offer transportation for them if they need, for example, assistive device replacement or they need to get like to their physical therapy appointments, the district will provide buses 
for them to transport them from their homes to um, the clinics and back. And also there has been support through monetary support. Like for example, again, I'll give the example of Gatagara Orthopedic Center in Nyanza, where they have been able to distribute some money to some of the uh, disabled people in the community. Uh, they have helped, so far in Nyanza, they have helped about 200 people uh, with monetary support and in terms of education, health, and um, other areas where they needed the support most. So uh, I'm actually like really proud to be in Rwanda where our government is also thinking about the people with disabilities in this time. Thank you, Claudine. We are going to the last question. Now, I want to remain, everybody, if you have questions, we still have two or three minutes to, to post them in um, the Q&A uh, box. They will all be answered. Uh, Zaira, there is a question for you. What role play the investment in accommodation, accommodative measure made for people living with disabilities in human capital, especially during the pandemic. Thank you so much. I hope my connection is clear this time. So sorry about that. Um, very quickly, I think that you know, in within our experience in higher education, it is very important for us to be implementing accommodations for our students and it, and staff and faculty. And it does a variety of things. One is obviously it makes it possible for students to have access to the educational experience, and that is extremely important both for their school experience and then their career, as many of the folks on the panel have highlighted. Um, but what I also want to, I think, emphasize that I've heard from many of the panelists is that it, it is really important for us to do this work so that in global health and medicine and nursing, people with disabilities are present in the decision-making process. And when they're present in that process, we put forward better solutions to all of the problems for a variety of different communities, including those with, people, uh, those with disabilities. And so I hope that at UGG and in many other academic settings that by investing in these accommodations, we're role modeling, but we're also creating space and opportunity for people with disabilities to be able to um, be at the helm of decisions around health and wellness around the globe. Thanks so much. Thank you. So thank you to our fantastic speakers who describe the community exclusion of people living with disabilities through personal experience or showing how they are excluded from data leading to exclusion of protocol. Thank you also to the participants for being part of this interesting and important conversation. And we count on all of us to raise awareness on injustice faced by people living with disabilities during this pandemic and beyond. Again, a big thank to you, uh, Dr. Zaira, the chair of the Department of Community Health and Social Medicine for hosting us. And for those who want to be in touch with the department of Dr. Zaira, please visit our web, email her, or send her a tweet. She will always answer. So the University of Global Health Equity, as you know, has equity in the core of our name. And we focus on equity, equity as a drive force of who we are. And it is now more than ever critical for bring together experts and change maker who champion disability, inclusion, uh, and awareness of disability right during this challenging time. In the wake of the pandemic, we should aim to support the most vulnerable and our work must include protect and empower those with disabilities. And we had Bryant inside during this event. And so I would like to extend a warm thanks to all attendees for your, str your strong engagement. There is a lot of question there. Know that all the questions will be answered if you uh, send them with the hashtag has Professor Agnes on Twitter, Instagram, or Facebook, and we are the, the, the panelists are committed to answer all of them, and uh, we give you a new appointment for the next month's has Professor Agnes webinar. Good afternoon, good morning, good evening to all of you, according to the place you are in the world. Thank you for being with us. Thank you. Thank you, Zaira. Thank you, Claudine. Thank you, Rupsa. Thank you, Sherry. Thank you, Maxwell. It was a great Thank conversation. You very much.
Bye bye. bye, -bye. Thank you, Professor Agnes. Bye bye. bye, -bye. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you all. Very lovely. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye.